Hi, my name is Katherine Baker. I'm Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy, and I'm excited to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about my own research. I'm a health economist. I study the US healthcare system, Medicare, Medicaid, how to make our public insurance programs and private insurance programs function a little better to ensure the health of the population. That is clearly top of everyone's mind today, and I'll come back to how that applies to our current public health crisis. But I wanted to take a few minutes to tell you about how I got into this area of research and some of my past projects and why the Harris School is a particularly exciting place to study issues like this. I started off thinking about what Medicaid does for people who get insurance through the public health care system. You might think that it would be really easy to know what the effect of a big public program like Medicaid is, but it's harder than you might think without a sophisticated statistical toolkit. Many of you know Medicaid is a program that's designed to ensure low-income populations in the U.S. You get on Medicaid if you are low-income and fall into certain demographic categories like being a pregnant woman, being a child, being disabled, being elderly and low-income. But not every state in the US covers all low income populations. Some states cover more generously than others do. Some states cover higher up the income distribution than others do. States have the choice to do that in the US. So if you wanted to know how effective public insurance was at improving people's health and affecting the healthcare resources that they use, you might naively start by comparing people who were insured to people who were uninsured, but that can be very misleading. In fact, people on Medicaid have a higher mortality rate than the uninsured. That doesn't mean that the Medicaid program is harming their health. It turns out that being poor is very harmful to your health in and of itself, and people who are on Medicaid tend to be lower income and tend to have higher health care needs. If you don't take that into account, you'll get a very mistaken idea of the effect of the program. I had the opportunity with a number of colleagues to study the effect of Medicaid in a way that let us really know what the program itself was doing. The state of Oregon had a waiting list for its Medicaid program, and they selected people from the waiting list by lottery. They did that not to generate a health insurance experiment. They did that because it seemed like the most fair way to allocate a limited number of spots. They had room for 10,000 people in their insurance policy, in their insurance program, but they knew they had a waiting list of something like 90,000 people who would like to gain access to the insurance. So they drew names by lottery, and those whose names were selected had the chance to enroll in the insurance program, and those whose names weren't did not. My colleagues and I realized that this was an actual randomized controlled trial of Medicaid. It gave us the chance to compare the healthcare use, health outcomes, and a wide range of other outcomes for people who were on Medicaid compared to people who were just like them, but who had not won the lottery and thus were not eligible to enroll in the program. We were able to study the costs and the benefits of expanding Medicaid. I'm an economist, so I always think about things in terms of costs and benefits. The first cost that we focused on was the increase in healthcare use. Now, to non-economists, expanding healthcare use might sound like the point of the program, not an actual cost. But I don't think anybody wants healthcare. People want health. They want the health improvements that healthcare can generate. Healthcare are the resources that are used to get that benefit of better health. So if you could expand, if you could improve health outcomes without using as many more healthcare resources, that would be a good thing. The healthcare resources are the cost. So we looked at the effect of Medicaid on healthcare use, and we found some things that were expected and some things that were surprising. I think on the expected side was that people who got Medicaid through the lottery went to the doctor more, they used more prescription drugs, they were more likely to get preventive care. I think this is exactly the kind of increase in healthcare use that proponents of expansion were expecting. We also saw some unexpected things though. People went to the hospital more, mostly because their doctor referred them, but they also went to the emergency room more, not less. I think in advance of this study, there had been hope that by expanding Medicaid, you would get people to go to the doctor instead of the emergency room, and that we might actually save money that way. But that doesn't seem to be the case. When people get Medicaid, they go to the emergency room much more than they do when they are uninsured. In fact, 40% more. 
This was very surprising to a lot of people. We got a lot of pushback on these results and people asked whether maybe this was just pent up demand, temporary, and would dissipate over time as people found primary care providers, but that didn't seem to be the case. We didn't, the, the case. We didn't see any drop off in emergency room use in the first six months, the second six months, the third, the fourth, the fifth. It seemed persistent over the time period we were able to study. People also thought that perhaps those who were going to the emergency room just didn't have access to primary care, and that's why they were going to the ER instead. But it turns out that having insurance makes the doctor and the emergency room more complementary, not more substitutable. People weren't substituting the doctor for the emergency room, they were going more to both. So this suggests that when you lower the price of healthcare, people use more healthcare across the board. They go to the doctor more, they go to the hospital more, they use more prescription drugs, and they go to the emergency room more. That's the cost side. What about the benefit side? Well, the first benefit we looked at was not one that people usually focus on, but I think is really important, and that's the financial security that insurance is supposed to provide. Health insurance is not just about getting you access to care, it's also about getting you uh, access to the financial resources to ensure that you're not evicted from your apartment because you paid your hospital bill instead of your rent. And in fact, we found that those who gained access to Medicaid through the lottery were substantially more financially secure than when they were uninsured. For example, they were less likely to have bills sent to collection, they were less likely to have to borrow money or skip paying other bills because of their health care expenses, they were much more financially stable. But then of course the benefit that people were very reasonably focused on is what happens to health outcomes? And there, there's a nuanced story to tell. Mental health improved substantially. We saw a 30% decline in the prevalence of clinical episodes of depression. And this is a really important health benefit. There are substantial unmet mental health needs among this population, and getting insurance increased the diagnosis and treatment of depression, as well as reducing the prevalence of depression. So that's a major benefit. Physical health is more of a mixed story. People reported that they were in much better health when we asked them about their health but we were not able to detect any improvements in blood pressure, in cholesterol, in diabetic blood sugar control, the chronic physical health conditions that people had hoped would improve with access to insurance. And there too, there was a lot of consternation when the results were revealed. People asked for maybe whether maybe we hadn't waited long enough, whether uh, improvements would show up over a longer time period, whether our sample wasn't big enough. And there, a deep understanding of the underlying statistics is really important for interpreting the results. For blood pressure, we were able to rule out the kinds of improvements that people had been expecting based on prior non-experimental studies. So we didn't detect any effects. That doesn't mean there weren't any effects, but we can rule out large positive effects and large negative effects. It's also a different story for diabetic blood sugar control. There, because a smaller share of the population had diabetes, we can't rule out that there were clinically meaningful improvements. We can say that there was an increase in diagnosis and treatment of diabetes. So there, there may have been improvements, but they were just too small to be statistically significant. That doesn't mean that health insurance didn't make people better off, of course. Their depression rates were lower and their self-reported health was much improved. So that leaves policymakers with a bit of a dilemma. Expanding insurance doesn't save money. Expanding insurance costs money because people use more care. But when you expand insurance, people are substantially better off than they were otherwise. They're more financially secure, their mental health improves, their self-reported health improves. So there are real benefits to those who are enrolled and there are real costs to taxpayers. And often those aren't the same people. And that raises some real political questions as well as economic ones. That brings me back to the Harris School and why I think the Harris School is such an exciting place to study issues like this. First, you have to understand what the underlying costs and benefits of any policy are. There are very few policies in the world where there are only upsides or only downsides. You almost always have to make a nuanced decision about trade-offs 
Which benefits are more important to you? Which populations do you want to target? Different policies are going to have different effects on different people, and you're always going to have to be weighing those trade-offs. The Harris School gives you the tools to do that. You also need to be able to interpret evidence. Evidence is rarely straightforward. There are always statistical complications, potential alternative explanations, confounding factors. Understanding what the data do and don't tell us is crucial to making a good evidence-based decision. And that's why we emphasize that evidence gathering and interpretation at the Harris School. And then there is the political economy, the political reality the game theory behind which things become policy and why, and how the environment in which decision making is made affects the ultimate outcomes. And that's why we also emphasize analytical politics and an understanding of how policy decisions are made in real world institutions. Bringing those together is what lets you address the complex policy environment that we find ourselves in. These are clearly really challenging times for public policy. The faculty and the students at Harris are hard at work in understanding how our current crisis can be best addressed through public policy, whether that's economic stimulus, public health measures, or other mechanisms to try to slow the spread of this pandemic. I think the toolkit that we have here is going to be of vital importance going forward. I know this is a strange time to be discussing these issues in a strange setting. I hope that you will be able to learn much more about what the faculty and students here at Harris are doing and how the toolkit can be best deployed to make the world a better, safer place.